And today I'm really excited to introduce our two presenters, uh, James Powelski and Catherine Cotter from the University of Pennsylvania. And they will be talking about their presentation, their work on art museums for well-being, a research initiatives in the humanities and human flourishing project. So we're excited to have Catherine and James with us today. Um, just the brief introduction, Catherine is the Associate Director of Research with the Humanities and Human Flourishing Project at the University of Pennsylvania, and James is the founding director of the same project, which uh, is a National Endowment for the Arts Research Lab. So very excited to have both of you here today, and at that, this point, I will turn it over to you to do any introductions and proceed with your presentation. Perfect. Thank you so much, Joanna. It's really uh, wonderful for us to be here at a kind of um, NEA research lab sibling. Uh, so uh, it's good to meet, good to get out and um, uh, have this opportunity to um, share some thoughts and uh, have some conversation about some things. So the way we thought we would proceed is I will plan to give kind of a, a, a an overview, a basic big picture framing of the work that we're doing. Uh, I'm uniquely positioned to do this because I'm a philosopher by training. So I get to talk about everything. Uh, and then Catherine will bring it down to the concrete uh, uh, realities of research and the, um, uh, the empirical sides of things that we're, uh, that we're doing. So hopefully between those two uh, big picture and really focused approaches, you'll get uh, something interesting out of today's presentations. So I will now endeavor to share my slides. Um, do you see the slides? Perfect. So I'd like to talk with you just for a few minutes about the positive humanities. And I'll explain what we mean by this new field in a moment. The positive humanities, arts, <clears throat> culture, and human flourishing. So I mentioned that I'm a philosopher by training. I've been involved in the field of positive psychology for over 20 years most of that time at the University of Pennsylvania, where I am a professor of practice in the Positive Psychology Center, and I direct the Master of Applied Positive Psychology program here. And as Joanna mentioned, I'm the founding director of the Humanities and Human Flourishing Project. So when I talk about the humanities, I mean it in a broad sense to include arts and culture as well. And when we think about these domains of our lives, things like music and literature, theater, movies, visual art, these are very important for our well being. They're very important for human flourishing. Now, if you don't believe me, imagine what our lives would be like if we didn't have these modes of uh, uh, th these traditions. If we didn't have, for example, music, what would your life be like? if you had never had access to music at all? How about if you'd never had access to novels or poems, any kind of narrative at all? What if you'd never seen a movie, never seen a play, and you'd never been able to look at visual art? It's hard to imagine our lives as being fully human without those kinds of activities. It's hard to imagine it being even possible to be a parent without those kinds of activities, right? Imagine bedtime and you have no lullabies, you have no bedtime stories, that would be horrific. So let's get those back uh, on our screen there. Um, what I'm gonna ask you uh, to do is to think about your own life. And um, is there anything, and, and, to, and to think about one particular exemplar, one particular um, work of, of, of music or of art or of literature that has been important to you in your own well being. And in just a moment, I'm going to invite you to share with us in the chat what the title of that work is. So, again, think about a piece of music, a song, a novel, poem, a movie, a play, a work of art, or some other work of arts and humanities that has, a bit, that has been important for your own well-being in your life. And just go ahead and enter that into the chat now.
All right, terrific. So the um, some examples are starting to uh, come in through the chats. We've got The Power of Myth by Joseph Campbell. Um, uh, metric Wet Blanket has gotten me through some tough times. So that's uh, that's good. Die Zauberflöte, Rothko and O'Keefe. Uh, and you know what? It's totally fine to admit exactly where we're at. Uh, Joanna, thank you. The original Annie movie, fantastic. Elegy written in a country churchyard. Uh, fantastic. That's a great, uh, great poem. Um, uh, uh, Pale Fire by Vladimir Nabokov. Duran Duran, everything from 79 to 88, love it. Uh, Robert Motherwell, Elegy to the Spanish uh, Republic, Blessing the Boats by Lucille Clifton, The Road Not Taken, um, Morrison Hotel, The Doors, uh, The Collages of Ramar Bearden, La Traversée des Temps by Eric Emmanuel Schmidt, Bach, St. John's Passion, Leaves of Grass, uh, Pete Seeger, everything by James Baldwin. Fantastic. So I wish now we could just take about three hours to have a conversation about these examples of culture and how they have played a role in their lives and what it is about them that have been so significant to us. These, these aspects, and thank you for sharing, really appreciate it. These aspects of culture are really important to our identity. They give us vital meaning. They're load-bearing columns in the architecture of our souls. They're what we turn to in good times and in bad times. At weddings, you turn to music, you turn to sacred scripture perhaps, you turn to dance together. At funerals, you turn to music, you turn to literature. Um, during a pandemic, you turn to, um, Music. Remember these these images from uh, Italy when Italians couldn't talk with each other, meet in cafes. They would go out on their balconies and serenade each other. And of course, this happened not just in Italy, but also other places around the world. In the fall of 2020, we conducted a survey, a representative sample uh, U.S. adults, and we decided to include some questions on the pandemic. And so one of the questions that we included uh, was on their asking uh, folks, to what extent have the arts and humanities helped you to cope with the coronavirus outbreak? And you can see that this is heavily skewed toward the right. People really endorsed uh, that they had relied on the arts and humanities at that time. And when we looked at those results, they were correlated, significantly correlated with just about every aspect of human flourishing we measured. Positive feelings, life satisfaction, optimism, meaning and purpose, self-worth, self-efficacy, accomplishment, engagement, belonging, uh, respect, trust. So it's amazing how strongly the correlation was uh, between engagement with arts and humanities as a way of coping and all these connections to well-being. Now, when you think about education, the arts and humanities have traditionally been a lot of, been really at the foundation of much of our education. So courses in literature and courses in history are an important part of our curriculum, which is why students are really thrilled when they get the opportunity to take courses in the arts and, uh, and hum uh, oh, well, maybe not always, Maybe they're not always thrilled to take these classes. Um, by a show of hands, how many of you have ever had a boring class in the arts and humanities? Just let me see your physical hand if you've ever had a class that was not scintillating in the arts and humanities. Well, why is that? Why is it that, that this domain that is so important for our well being can also be kind of not interesting uh, in certain? Uh, it, when, it, when it's approached in certain ways. Well, I think it's because arts and humanities are used for a variety of purposes, right? And so when you read a novel in a literature class in high school, you find out very quickly that the purpose of your reading the novel is not for your enjoyment, but rather for your reading comprehension or for your writing ability when you write the book report afterwards, right? Now, I have nothing against uh, increasing 
academic abilities, obviously. But that's not why we have novels. Novelists didn't write their books so that school kids could increase their reading comprehension. There's something else going on here. And when you think about music, um, you know, if you think about places like, you know, platforms like Spotify, they use music as a way of making a lot of money. And they do. It's an economically successful platform. Again, I have nothing against making money, but that's not why we have music. Why is it that we have literature and music and art and theater and so on? Well, I think it has less to do with the academic or the economic and more to do with the eudaimonic. I think we have these expressions of our humanity because they're connected with our well-being, because they're connected with human flourishing. So it's important to acknowledge that these domains can be used for a variety of legitimate ends, but not to lose sight of what I think of as the core intrinsic benefits connected with well-being, both for individuals and for communities. So this is where I would say the positive humanities come in. So what do we mean by the positive humanities? I would like to define the positive humanities as a new field of inquiry and practice concerned with the relationship between culture and human flourishing. If you think about the words culture and flourishing, they're botanical metaphors. Culture comes from the Latin word that means to cultivate a field. So when a farmer cultivates a field, if that goes well, if that's successful, then the plants will flourish. I think similarly, if human culture is successful, then human beings ought to flourish. Taking this uh, from a historical perspective, arts and culture have long been connected with education for flourishing. And so you think about the Greek paideia, the Roman artes liberales, and other forms of education that arose during the, actual, uh, the axial age, these were very concerned with helping to make sure that citizens were properly trained so they could live uh, a, a flourishing life in a flourishing community. There's a sense in which the humanities are a gift of, uh, of a pandemic, a pandemic far worse than the COVID pandemic, uh, namely the Black Death. And so Petrarch was an Italian poet living at that time, and he needed help. He, so many of his friends and even his son were sickened by the Black Death and died. And when he turned to the literature and the, and the, um, the humanities of the day, he found that they had gotten academicized. That is to say, there was a lot of focus on how can we understand um, the, you know, how can we get caught up in this process of interpreting literature and um, looking at the various um, logical forms and techniques here, as opposed to how can this give me uh, what I need, the sustenance and guidance that I need, the wisdom that I need to live my life well. So Petrarch focused on the humanities as a way of living our individual and collective lives well. And so his followers came to be known as humanists, and thence we have the humanities. Now, of course, there were limitations on how the Greeks approached Paideia and the liberal arts. Uh, you know, you could have these access to this education only if you were a citizen. That meant, um, you know, no enslaved persons need apply, no women need apply. So it's way too limited. So we can certainly do better than the ancient cultures, but we can also learn from some of their approaches, again, focusing on well-being. So broadening out this definition a little bit, um, I, I wanna, wanna say more broadly that the positive humanities are the interdisciplinary multi-industry and cross-sector examination and optimization of the relationship between the experience, creation, and study of human culture and the understanding, assessment, and cultivation of human fl flourishing. Breaking that down a little bit, <clears throat> interdisciplinary. So not just philosophy, not just history, not just arts, visual arts, music, but across these disciplines, they're all connected to well-being. Multi-industry, the music industry, the publishing industry, et cetera, the movie industry, cross-sector, across non uh, nonprofit organizations as well. We need to understand what's actually going on 
We need to examine it. And we also need to think about how we can optimize the effects of engagement with arts and culture on well being. We need to consider the experience of uh, arts and culture, the creation and the study of it. Oftentimes in at the academy, we focus super uh, strongly on the study of human culture, uh, but the creation and experience of it is all, are, those are also extremely important. And then the goal here is to understand the relationship between uh, engagement in arts and culture on the one hand and human flourishing on the other hand, to be able to understand it, to assess it, and then to cultivate it so we can have more of it. Natalie Bondil at the Institut du Monde Arabe in Paris, France has said something that I think is really, really powerful. She has said, I am convinced that in the 21st century, culture will be to health what sports were in the 20th century. Cultural experiences will be seen to contribute to our well being the same way sports do to our physical conditioning. Now, 100 years ago, it wasn't obvious to everyone that exercise, physical exercise, was important for our well being. In fact, some people thought that women in particular should not exercise because that could be really damaging to them. Happily, in the 100 years uh, since then, we now know that exercise is important for everyone. And a key to this transformation of our cultural perspective is science. We know that um, scientific investigations have uh, uh, indicated so many of the uh, physical health and psychological health benefits of physical exercise. So I think looking at uh, what Natalie Bondil here is saying, if we think about engagement and cultural experiences, what we need is scientific work that can help us understand the various uh, possible outcomes of various possible ways of engaging with different kinds of contexts. And so that is what we're trying to do in the Humanities and Human Flourishing Project is to bring together these experiences of arts and culture with their scientific investigation. We focus on theory, research, and practice. We have a growing network of more than 150 leading scholars, researchers, and professionals. We've uh, uh, put out some foundational publications. We're also doing some basic research, uh, and I'll shortly turn it over to my colleague, Catherine Cotter, to tell you more about some of these. Um, and we're aimed with our work to dissemination and application. This isn't just about creating new knowledge. It's also about applying that knowledge and working with cultural organizations, schools, universities, and governments to optimize the well-being effects of arts and humanities. We've created a conceptual model, which I'll not go into in detail now, but just you see here is arts and humanities engagement. There are a, a set of mechanisms we call the raise mechanisms that we believe are effective for a wide variety of human flourishing outcomes, neurological, physiological, psychological, and then also social. These are the raise um, mechanisms, reflection, acquisition, immersion, socialization, and expression. We can talk about these more during the Q&A time if you would like. But for now, uh, we've created a toolkit also to measure uh, those, um, those mechanisms. We've begun publishing uh, books in this domain, so the eudaimonic turn, uh, well-being and literary studies in 2013. We followed that with a poetry anthology on human flourishing. Uh, my wife and I published a, a book together called Happy Together, Using the Science of Positive Psychology to Build Love That Lasts, incorporating arts and culture with uh, research in positive psychology. Just last year, we published the Oxford Handbook of the Positive Humanities, 38 chapters oriented toward the social sciences, trying to collect in one cover as much under one cover as much as we could about the current state of, uh, of work in these domains. We've also brought together groups of scholars across eight different disciplines in the arts and humanities, philosophy, history, religious studies and theology, literary studies, art, music, theater, and film to um, meet together and to ask them, what does your discipline or what can your discipline contribute to the conceptualization and cultivation of human flourishing. We're now publishing a series, a book series with Oxford University Press, one volume for each of these domains. So already out are books on philosophy and human flourishing, for example, history, cinema and media, theater and liter literary studies. The others are yet to come. And then finally, in terms of our current work, uh, we're working on uh, looking at the effects of arts and cultural engagement, particularly on the development of black youth. Uh, of course, 
these que- these uh, these domains beg questions about access. And so, what are the specific um, uh, uh, outcomes or specific possible outcomes in different um, segments of the population? In particular, we're looking at Black youth. Uh, my colleague Krista Maloba, who is on this call, is leading that effort. The role of the positive humanities in reducing the threat of mass shootings. Uh, again, we can talk about this more during the Q&A if you'd like, but the, the basic point is that those who engage in mass violence have a certain connection to culture. There's a certain negative kind of dark culture that they connect with. And so by looking to um, be able to identify that and create uh, possibilities for more positive cultural offerings, we're working to try to reduce the threat of mass shootings. We've just begun uh, efforts on looking at the effect of music on well-being. Most of our work to this point and the empirical level has been on the effects of art museum visits on well-being. And we're really interested in, in how this can, can work together uh, so that we can have um, positive arts and culture in thriving cities and uh, more broadly in our society. So with that, I will now turn it over to my colleague, Catherine Cotter, who will talk more about the specific empirical work that we have been doing. Great, uh, thank you, James. Uh, yes, so uh, again, my name is Catherine Cotter and I am a researcher with the Humanities and Human Flourishing Project. So my training um, is in psychology and I've been leading our work focusing on art museums as institutions that can cultivate well-being. So I'll just give um, a brief overview about some of the work we've been doing in this area, and then I'm more, and ha more than happy to dive into uh, greater specifics if there are questions about different projects or specific elements of this work. So when you think of museums, I whenever I give one of these presentations, I always have to start with this quote from Jeffrey Smith's book, The Museum of Fact. It's an absolutely fabulous book if you've not come across it. Um, but in this book, he delves into the roles that museums, libraries, and other cultural institutions play in our society and says that museums, libraries, and cultural institutions provide opportunities for people to understand and celebrate who they are, were, and might be. And I think it is a really powerful uh, idea that it's not just about the objects on display or the things hung on the walls, but that there is a deep psychological aspect to our engagement with these institutions and what we can take away from this form of engagement. And so research into the role of art museums and cultiv cultivation of well-being has in recent years really been growing um, in really remarkable ways. And in a recent review that we conducted, we found that research has tended to focus on four broad domains of well-being or flourishing. First on people's emotional experiences. So how does going to an art museum change your emotions um, or what emotions does it evoke? And what research has indicated is that we feel more engaged in our life more generally after having visited an art museum, but also feel an enhancement in our positive emotions. We show reductions in our uh, mental or enhancements in our mental health through reducing things like stress, anxiety, consistent uh, art museum visitation over our lifespan has been associated with lower risk of dementia, um, so it can keep us more cognitively engaged potentially. We also feel subjectively that we're doing better. We have higher subjective well-being, feel a greater quality of life through engaging with these institutions, but also feel more connected to one another. So going to art museums, particularly for older adults who may be at a greater risk of social isolation, feel less disconnect and feel enhanced um, feelings of community through engaging with art museums. But um, as we all know, art museums don't just pop out of nowhere. Um, these are carefully curated experiences and designed experiences of what art is on display, how it is displayed, how we engage with that particular um, experience. And so what had been really missing from, from this literature is what do people who are cultivating this experience, the art museum professionals, think and feel about um, well-being as something that's relevant to the institution. So psychologists have gone in and measured a whole host of things, but what are the actual individuals that are shaping these experiences and so vital to these experiences? 
think around this. And so we also conducted a national survey of art museum professionals and asking them, what do you see the aims of art museums as being? Is well-being an aim that's relevant to art museums or is it a nice byproduct of going to a museum, but it's just this nice thing on the side? And are there specific pieces of well-being or ill-being that should ideally be improved by visiting museums? So are there certain pieces of well-being that um, these individuals feel are particularly important for art museums to focus on and to cultivate? And so to quickly orient you um, to this graph, um, part of the questions we asked were, what are the current aims? of art museums and what should the aims be? And so this uh, figure represents the difference. So bars that are in green here indicate areas where art museums want to improve or uh, give higher priority to particular facets of their operations. And of these, well-being was ranked the highest. So art museum professionals saw and feel that well-being of their visitors should be a priority and of the um, various priorities we inquired about, it was the one that needed the most work to address. But there were also several other closely aligned, like being a space for um, the community, helping to facilitate social interactions, helping people to change their worldview or think about their worldview, um, provide opportunities for cultural engagement and education. So it seems as though art museum professionals also feel that their spaces are able to do this, but maybe they're not doing it as well as they would like to, or it's not as high a priority as they feel it should be. When we asked more specifically about um, individual outcomes, they indicated that trying to enhance empathy, reduce close-mindedness, helping people feel greater self-acceptance and less self-doubt, and helping people reduce social disconnect and feel more connected to others was uh, of the, of the different um, outcomes we looked at were the highest priorities, which is um, in line with many of the things that psychologists had already been researching in connection with art museums, but it also identified some areas that we haven't been focusing on, like self-acceptance or uh, doubt. But um, as I'm sure it's a surprise to nobody. There's been a lot of shifts in how we've been engaging with art. Um, and so traditionally, often folks think about when I want to engage with art, I go to the art museum. And then uh, the pandemic certainly uh, turned that on its head with many art museums having to close and a lot of museums uh, curating specific virtual experiences, putting their collections online, hosting tours, hosting online workshops. Um, but relatively little research had um, at that point really delved into, well, what, what's happening when we engage uh, in this manner. And so, and we, we conducted an initial project just wondering, do we get anything out of engaging in a digital environment? And so first we were just examining, can a brief virtual gallery visit change our emotions? Does it help us to feel the well-being impacts and are we able to become immersed in the experience as we might when we go to the, the art museum? Can we get immersed and lose a um, sense of time and feel absorbed in those experiences? And so in a very initial preliminary test of this, we use the Open Gallery for Arts Research, which is a fabulous tool where you can curate your own gallery um, and track what people are doing in that gallery. And so we just had eight artworks from the Philadelphia Museum of Art placed in the gallery and gave people 15 minutes to, to explore the gallery and just measured their emotions, their well-being before and after, and did they feel immersed uh, in the experience. And so people did feel as though they could become immersed in this virtual gallery experience, which is a nice um, initial sign. So it seems like people can engage in a meaningful way, but it also had impacts on people's emotional experiences. And so to orient you here, this is people's um, post-visit emotional experience uh, subtracted their um, pre-visit. And so what we saw is that um, people felt less energetic, but more relaxed. So it seems to kind of bring our activation level down a bit, makes us a more calm state, but really had a lot of impacts on our negative emotions and helping to reduce our negative emotionality while simultaneously enhancing our feelings of being 
uh, in a sense of awe or getting moved or feeling chills. So these really powerful aesthetic experiences that we might associate with seeing an artwork or a masterpiece in person may also be evoked in a digital space if people are able to become immersed in those experiences. And further, we did a similar set of analyses examining changes in well-being from before and after the visit. And what we saw is that people's overall well-being were thriving, increased, they had an increase in life satisfaction, self-acceptance. So one of those outcomes that our museum professionals thought that uh, museums could address, uh, as well as changes in people's personal growth and no uh, indices of well-being included decreased, which is always a good sign. So we didn't necessarily harm people through, through putting them through a short virtual gallery uh, experience. And so we're continuing our virtual gallery work currently. We're continuing some of our now in-person, in-museum work, uh, as well as serving visitors to better understand um, a more multifaceted view on their, their flourishing. And so um, obviously have to thank our funders for supporting this work um, and provide my email in case anyone's curious about any of this in the future. But uh, with that, I will turn things back over to Joanna to, to get us started in the Q&A. Looking forward to discussing. Great. Thank you, James. And th thank you, Catherine. So uh, just like usual, if you have any comments or questions, just put them into the chat or raise your hand and I will moderate and call on everyone. Um, so I'm going to start. Uh, Carol also has a great chat. So I'm going to start with a question that um, when you use this analogy of sports 100 years ago, we didn't know that exercise was good for us, right? So now we generally, through science, have understood that it's good to move. So I guess I'm trying to think about right now um, what maybe we don't know that culture and the arts are generally, or the humanities are generally good for us and enhance well-being. Maybe we do, maybe we don't, but if we I think at this point, we kind of do. Like everybody would probably agree that if they didn't have music or art in their lives, then that would be um, that would be decreasing their well-being. So how do we explain the levels of cultural engagement, for example, in this country, that we have really small populations attending museums and um, you know, opera attendance is going down, mm. classical music is going down. Mm. What, what could help explain that? So my guess is that, you know, my guess is that a hundred years ago when people exercised, they felt good. They've, you know, they, they had the same kinds of benefits that we do today, but culturally there was a kind of framing around it that was not as supportive. Uh, in, in some cases, and certainly not as nuanced, right? And so how often should you exercise in a week? What kinds of exercise should you do? What kinds of exercise should you do with certain conditions that you may have, you know, certain health issues that you may have and so forth? So I think that, um, that on the one hand, we know what, you know, when you go to an art museum, you, you, oftentimes you have this great connection of, of you know, you turn on, whatever you're, um, you know, we all have our our favorites, um, at, but we have this 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 connection that we've had. But in our culture, we don't we we lack this this framing that I think is um, both. You know, when you're in a in, a, in an education um, environment and and money is tight, oftentimes it's the music and the art programs that go first, right? And so because those are seen as just kind of being add-ons and, and really not that important, is that true? Um, is it is it the, to the contrary? And then in how ought we to engage with arts and culture? Um, I was just um, part of a, a a meeting of researchers in Australia, and they've gotten some evidence that uh, seems to indicate that there's a two hour kind of threshold that if you're engaged in arts and culture two hours or more per week, then you have certain benefits uh, at least correlationally. Um, so I don't know. Is that a number that you know? I, I think the um, the uh, recommendation is 75 minutes of vigorous or moderate exercise per week. Uh, is it two hours of you know uh, cultural engagement per week? And are there certain kinds of ways of engaging? Is creation more important than observation, or is doing it with others more important than you know? Is it fine to do it 
uh, digitally, as Catherine was talking about, or do we really need to be in place? Like there are all kinds of questions that I think we need to to, to explore and find answers to. James, and, I, and along those lines, I think in some ways, some of those numbers can be very misleading around what people's actual cultural engagement is. So I know um, from other research, a lot of times people aren't engaging because they don't see it as a place for them or relevant to them. So if you're not going to an art museum because artwork from your cultural background is not represented, whether in the artist or what's being depicted, you're less likely to go. But when you do feel represented, you get more out of the experience and more likely to return. So I think music is like an interesting one because there's a lot of levels in which you can engage with music. You can go to the opera, you can go to classical concerts, you can also go to pop concerts, but you also have Spotify. And there's a lot of other ways that music can fit into your lives that are not necessarily the formal attendance numbers that I think often have been a focus of we're declining in our cultural engagement, but maybe it's in new ways that isn't being measured or tracked in the same way as concert attendance is perhaps. Yeah, very good point, Catherine. Carol has a question about how you're defining humanities, arts, and culture. So all of these three words different in your work. Um, it seems as though arts and culture together are under the umbrella of the humanities, and maybe it's less than useful to define these arenas that way since they have very different sorts and levels of institutionalization and social associations. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, it's a great question. And, and um, the short answer is no, we have not. Um, there's, a, there's a danger of like over defining things in a way that then doesn't align with usage in the culture. And I think, unfortunately, we have a lot of um, uh, lack of specificity of how these terms are used. And so the humanities, I think, is a very academic term. Uh, and so we talk about the positive humanities, but when we go out to, you know, um, uh, institutional organizations, they may or may not know what we really mean by that. So we do try to emphasize that we're talking about uh, certainly the humanities in a way that's very expansive, that includes the arts. Um, arts and culture is another term that's used, I think, uh, more likely out in the, um, uh, in, in the public sphere um, that's useful too. Uh, we do have a paper where we uh, we, we did a, a qualitative survey of uh, what is meant by the humanities, um, and we find that there's a lot of overlap between um, that and the arts. We do distinguish a little bit as well. There's some differentiation between what people mean by the humanities and the arts. Oftentimes, the arts are refer referred to something more um, more more connected to creation. So I, I'm I'm um, it's the practice of the arts, whereas the humanities are sometimes used in ways to denote the study of those practices. But again, for every for every example, you can think of you know probably uh, way more exceptions. So we're using those terms um, loosely, uh, but hopefully effectively enough to kind of get across uh, what we're trying to uh, aim at. It reminds me of someone here who works in the humanities at a very high administrative position who called the arts and culture a spotlight hog in the humanities. So, <laughs> Michael. Hey, thank you, James and Catherine, for a really interesting presentation. Um, I have a thought, and this goes all the way back to James's slide number nine. You, you can tell I was taking notes here. <laughs> <laughs> and slide number nine was the COVID slide, where we asked, how did the, uh, how did the arts help you through uh, uh, COVID? And uh, you had all kinds of positive correlations with other good things in people's lives in that data. Um, what, if I, what if I flipped that? And what if I said, you know, what's happening here is that people who have those good things in their life, are essentially in a place where they are ready to receive the arts uh, in, in terms of, because I, I am in a particular mindset and my life is going a particular way, I'm going to take the time to read a novel that a teacher hasn't even assigned me. Uh, I'm going to uh, listen to a record just for the sake of listening to a record. Uh, I'm going to engage in, in some arts uh, activities because I'm ready for it. 
And I, my intuition is that there's something to that directional flow. Um, when John Maynard Keynes founded the Arts Council of Great Britain in 1945, right? Um, an essay, a famous essay of his that predates that moment is his 1930 essay, Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. And he looked forward to a future where we would have far more time on our hands than we did back then. Um, and his main concern was that we would have to change our mindsets, change our worldviews to be ready to engage in the, in the arts. Not training in the arts, not how to read a novel closely or anything like that, but to be of a mind where material concerns are put to one side, where we are open to these possibilities and that this was going to be the big challenge for the future was getting people there rather than having people constantly trying to chase money and wealth and, and other pursuits. Um, and un unfortunately he didn't quite get what he wanted in the year 2023. But I wonder if you have any thoughts on just the directional flow of that slide that you had uh, in terms of is the real question here, are people ready to go to a museum or are they in a frame of mind where they think, I'd like to go to a museum, that would really be a thing for me. Brilliant. Sorry about that. There we go. Unmuting makes it easier for you to hear me. So I was just saying thank you, Michael, for that uh, great set of reflections and that question. I really appreciate it. And I hope you're right. I really do hope that the um, I hope that the that the arrow of causation goes both directions, actually. Right. Because then we can get an upward spiral because then engaging, you know, if I feel if I'm feeling if I have well-being, then I'm more likely to engage in these kinds of pursuits. And that's more likely to increase my well-being. And I'm more likely to, right? So that's what I hope happens. My guess is that it's not only the direction of people high in well-being then engage in arts and culture. Um, keep in mind that this was the survey was done, I believe it was September and October of 2020. So, you know, many of us were taking something of a hit to our well-being at that time um, uh, in uh, in our lives. I think that the that that maybe one of the things that was not um, on John Maynard uh, King's uh, um, horizon at that point was people who would try to make money off of other people's leisure time. So we do have much more discretionary time, I think now in general than we had a hundred years ago, but we also have businesses whose model is to try to gobble up that time, to try to gobble up that attention, to keep us focused on digital platforms, for example, in ways that will <laughs> bring them money and won't necessarily add to our well-being. So I think one of the real challenges of our day is how to um, exert the effort or the self-discipline to engage in leisurely activities that will actually increase and not decrease our well-being. And so it's, you know, it's a lot easier to pick up TikTok than it is to go to an art museum. And so I think that's um that that's something that bears further research and further um further emphasis because we want to make sure that we're uh, uh allowing time for that upward spiral, allowing space for that upward spiral to to happen if indeed it's that's how it is. You have some good questions in the chat. So Diane has a question. Um, the emphasis on museums, and I think you used museums as a particular example in your work, um, as opposed to an emphasis. However, I did want to highlight the, the is I think the question she asks is a really good one, which is, is there any kind of um, is there sorry, is there an assumption in your work? or desire to determine or defend that certain culturally specific forms of art are better suited to well-being than others? Uh, so I would say no. <laughs> um, I think, and James didn't have time to go into this in his um, portion, but I think our emphasis is more, what is the manner of engagement regardless of the content of engagement or in so, to some degree, the content of engagement is more in the manner. 
Um, so he very briefly mentioned our conceptual model that posits five different mechanisms, which are um, the, kind of the manner in which you're engaging or what is the nature of that engagement that would help flourishing. So one example is immersion. So to the, the degree to which we're able to become absorbed and become in the flow of the experience and pay close attention to it. So not just having Spotify on in the background while you're working, but actually engaging with it in a meaningful, uh, immersed way, perhaps engaging in reflection, those sorts of things, regardless if it's at an art museum, listening to something on Spotify, maybe even watching someone's TikTok video that could potentially have well-being. So art museums happen to be where we've started uh, in this work, but we are certainly moving into other forms of artistic engagement and are not trying to assert certainly that the art museum is the pinnacle of well-being, um, but it has been studied quite uh, particularly recently, quite extensively, particularly as we get into like social prescribing models, which we didn't talk about, but a lot of um, in, in Europe in particular, physicians can prescribe arts engagement to help with feelings of loneliness or social disconnect. And a lot of those have been to things like choirs, but also to art museums, for example. And so I think there's been a lot of attention on well, art museums in a well-being light recently, which is why we've started there, but are not ending there, certainly. I would also add, I think that's a great answer, Catherine. I would also add there's the ethics or the ethical question. When we started this work, I think some folks thought we were um, champions of any kind of engagement in arts and culture. Um, and it turns out that that some engagement in arts and culture can be quite damaging. I um, mean, you know, just think about uh, the way the Nazis used propaganda. And, you know, so, so it can be used for a lot of different ends, a lot of different goals. I mentioned academic uh, and economic, but it can also be used for political and sometimes very unethical ends. Um, so my my example of from TikTok, as Catherine mentioned, that's, that's not to say that there's something wrong with a TikTok video, but if you're engaging with that TikTok video in a way that is just endlessly scrolling uh, and you're you know not getting sleep and so on and so forth, that's where the the problem can be. So it's a complex kind of domain that needs to keep take in mind uh, ethical situation, the context, questions of access. Uh, that's one reason why we're super excited to uh, be joined by our, our colleague, Krista Malobo, um, whom I mentioned is working specifically to look at how are the, the arts and culture um, uh, related to the development of uh, ethnic identities in, in, in Black youth. So we can't just assume that, you know, one size fits all. I keep on going back to the picture of the really bored student, thinking that museums are a great case study because not everybody likes to go in one, right? Um, so another question from Julie is, um, you're clearly talking about the individual well-being connection to the humanities, but I'm, she's wondering if you've ever studied collective well-being, for example, the impact of art on society as a whole. Catherine, you want to take that? Sure. So uh, presently, we have not focused on those things. But again, we're just giving lots of shout, shout outs to Chris. Um, <laughs> so she is starting some work around um, social justice and how the arts can potentially be a way in which for people to think about social justice, um, attitudes, behavioral intentions around social justice, for example. Um, personally, my training is in psychology and has focused more on the individual level. Um, so part of that's a byproduct of just the kind of uh, empirical orientation that I uh, come from. Um, but we don't believe that it's just an individual well-being uh, premise. There are certainly collective outcomes um, that can come from artistic engagement. Tal has a great question too, and this has been on my mind. Um, so we know that access to art and arts engagement is in general is distributed very unequally. Do you think that the fact that arts engagement is essential for human flourishing justifies governmental intervention in reducing those cultural inequalities? And how do you consider questions of cultural policy as part of your positive humanities project? So let me um, just point out one way of coming into this, which is a very rich question, thank you. Um, and that is in terms of the creators themselves, the providers of this richness. So, you know, when I was um, uh, first 
working on this domain, I one of my students was a uh, uh, a cellist in the Philadelphia Orchestra, and me, I thought, wow, like that's your job. You you play classical music all the time, and this is great. You must be absolutely flourishing. And I found out from her that the situation is actually quite different um, for many musicians. And her view is that a large part of that is because they lack autonomy. So she doesn't get to choose what she plays, when she plays it, with whom she plays it, or how she plays it. And um, I've also since had uh, a student who is uh, with the American Ballet Theater. And she also talks about you know, ballet dancers as also oftentimes suffering from um, lower levels of well-being, certainly than, than one might expect. So, and then of course, during the pandemic, who were the people who were most easily let go? Uh, people who were, you know, living the gig economy, people who, I mean, you know, theaters, what could they do during that time? So there's a real um, underfunding under supporting, I think, undervaluing. Um, and we could even think of it as a kind of, you know, psychological exploitation in a way of these creators and performers who bring these wonderful experiences to us. So there's that side of it, in addition to the access side, uh, that I think um, really we need to, to, to think much more carefully about uh, in this country and take care of the people who bring these things to us. Yeah, and I'm also thinking of James, um, correct me if I'm wrong on the what this stands for, but the PSYOP project, the Social Impacts of the Arts um, project, which is also at Penn, um, where they did some fabulous research looking at like geographically where are arts and cultural institutions in New York City and the different boroughs and the kind of by zip code by block well-being in like a kind of general metric and the the greater proximity you had to arts and culture the the greater well-being that kind of zip code block area had and so i do i do think it's a good point that there there is unequal access which is why i think i'm quite interested in like this virtual gallery space because there isn't that geographic limitation um, in doing some of this research with online participants. So these were not student samples that I was focusing on for this work. I had people, I had participants messaging me not angry at something not working, which is a rarity for when you're doing online research, of course, um, but saying, I haven't been to an art museum in years because of X, Y, Z reason. I'm not living near one anymore. I physically can't get to one because of um, an injury or age. And so I think, I think some of these less rooted in geography places or types of engagement, things like Spotify or these virtual um, opportunities that have some really interesting accessibility um, implications, but certainly there is inequities that's not just geographic. There are um, a whole host of systemic um, and cultural barriers to artistic engagement that personally, I do think a greater intervention is something that is necessary and warranted when I look at other uh, nations and how the arts and culture are championed in a very different way than in the U.S. in particular. And just another follow-up to, to Tal's, you know, really great question. I think that's another reason why we really need evidence, because I don't think we have enough of a scientific understanding at this point about the conditions under which, the context under which um, this, uh, you know, engagement with arts and culture is helpful. So it's hard, I think, to 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 create policy with a lot of confidence that we're heading in, you know, we can we can generally think we're going in the right direction, but what about those, you know, what about those nuances? And I think that's a a reason why both our group and your group is is very grateful to the National Endowment for the Arts for being uh, one of the few places where you can turn to uh, support uh, this kind of research so that we can get this evidence based and change policy. Um, I have an, another question that came to me in another chat, but and then I'll get to Jennifer's question uh, since it's a good, I think, fi finishing question. But so it is. So a lot of what you showed in your in your presentation was kind of the ubiquity of art in our daily lives. Um, but if you think about a hundred years ago, access to the arts was much more costly and rare. 
So the question then is kind of big picture is well being just vastly better nowadays. Um, so I think what we're trying to, to what, what you're trying to do here is kind of create this connection between the humanities and well being, maybe the humanities causing the latter, but perhaps kind of life today is just really great and certainly better than a hundred years ago. And, you know, and that's also just associated with the ubiqui ubiquity of art in our lives. I mean, I think few of us would choose to live our lives a hundred years ago, as opposed to today. I don't know whether we would then say that our lives are just great. Um, and that's perfect. I mean, if you think about the example of food, right? So there have been times in our human history when food has been scarce. And I don't think any of us would want, and there are times now in certain places in the world and so forth where food is scarce or precarious. And I don't think any of us would, would willingly want to live in those kinds of environments. But just because most of us, at least on this call, have ready access to food, aren't worried about where our lunch is going to come from or our dinner is going to come from, doesn't mean that we're just fine with regard to food. Some of us don't eat as healthily as we should. Some of us, uh, you know, uh, we really like to load up on the on the salty foods or the fatty foods, or you know, eat too much or eat too late. Or you know, so there's there's always there are always ways in which we can fine tune our relationship with food. And I think this, the same thing happens with arts and culture. Just because it's available doesn't mean that we're now, you know, in paradise with regard to that. There are ways in which we can think about how uh, engaging with it can support our well-being. And to build off that a little bit, I'm thinking of Maslow's hierarchy of needs with like self-actualization and some of these more like meaning-oriented um, spaces. And I think the arts are particularly good at, at triggering some of those um, food pyramid for the humanities, love it, <laughs> in the chat, Doug. <laughs> um, but kind of thinking of, of that structure, I do think maybe some of those lower levels are in a more stable place now than 100 years ago, allowing for potentially greater growth at some of those higher levels or higher um, places, higher as like a, not the best term, but what's coming to me at the moment, but like some of those higher up levels of well-being, I think there's more opportunity and availability to engage in that in a more deep way that can enhance well-being in a different direction than perhaps a hundred years ago was as readily available. And the last question I just want to put forth is Jennifer's question, which is where do you recommend a state start this process to bring this discussion to their partners and grantees? I'm sorry, where, a state? A state, like, a local, like a, gov yeah, a state uh, government, uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, Indiana, or like the Arts Commission or something like that. Yeah, well, again, I think it's important to acknowledge the various ways in which arts and culture are used. Uh, maybe some school children would say abused uh, in, our, in our culture and, and focusing on the, not just thinking of arts and culture as potentially, you know, the, the, the icing on the cake, but maybe being really, key important parts of our um, uh, of our individual and culture and, 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 and collective well-being. And there is beginning to um, uh, arise a body of work. People are coming at this from different perspectives now. And so there's it's an exciting time to be in this space. And I think keeping an eye on the 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 empirical results that come out, the framings that come out, we're gonna, I think, I think we're on the right side of history. And I think we're gonna be able to move with stronger and stronger arguments uh, towards making those kinds of uh, policy changes that I think we all uh, we all would like to see. And I think in a related direction, the, the research really shows that consistent engagement across, across the lifespan is most strongly connected to these different well-being outcomes that we've been discussing. And one of the biggest predictors of that continuous engagement is were you involved as a child? So I think a really great starting point potentially um, from like a government or policy perspective is ensuring that in school age, there are opportunities to take the field trip to the art museum, to a concert, to the theater, or making sure there is um, coursework in particular related to these things, because that seems to be um, a big impetus for engagement in adulthood and across the, the lifespan is really having those experiences in your formative years. Great. 
Well, thank you, James, and thank you, uh, thank you, Catherine. We really appreciated you being here with us today, and obviously the conversation that you helped stimulate. So, thank you so much. Thank you. It's terrific to be here. And thank you all to attending and also for sticking with us this entire academic year. We've had a really great series this year and we will um, relaunch this next year. And I probably will send out some kind of call for nominations to see people talk about work that you're interested in. So um, stay tuned for that. But thanks again for joining us all year. And um, for those on the academic time schedule, um, wish you the best in these last few weeks.